But today we're going to talk about the millimeter wave permittivity reference development project. I think we really present this as a path to a new standard reference material, and we'll talk a little bit about what that means in, as we get through these slides. Before I get started, I want to talk a little bit about the importance of dielectrics. I think everybody kind of recognizes that they're important, but you know, if you really step back and think about this, dielectrics are everywhere and they influence the performance and in, in many cases, the cost of essentially every electronic device that we use. And if you look at the title of the presentation, we're really focusing the project as uh, you know, a millimeter wave project. And typically people think of millimeter waves as being essentially the bandwidth between about 30 gigahertz and maybe 300 or so. And so that's a you know, pretty high set of frequencies. And most of the time when you think about millimeter wave, or if you read this in a magazine, the thing that you think of is either 5G or 6G radio applications, maybe something to do with patch antennas where you're going to have a very small phased array antenna that's maybe a base station, or perhaps it's in your cell phone and it's gonna have a very directed pattern to connect to some sort of host. Uh, so those are the kinds of things that immediately come to mind. But if you look at this frequency range, this is a huge frequency range, and it really overlaps pretty nicely with compute and next generation IO for CPU applications. So when you think about millimeter wave and you kind of go down this path of, okay, that must be radio, radio and 5G, 6G, it really is much, much more than that. And the importance of the dielectrics are not just for radio applications. You know, if you look at this, the typical cross section of a high performance microprocessor package, there are many layers of dielectrics in this, and, and the performance of those dielectrics really influence the performance of the product. And so, even though we say that our focus here is primarily millimeter wave, that really spans a huge array of applications and use cases. And so most of these things that we talk about, either if they're in the radio space or if they're in the compute space, they're really ultra high volume industries. And what I mean by that is you're not building a couple of high performance parts. You're building potentially tens or even hundreds of millions of devices. And so if you make the wrong decision in selecting your dielectric, you can incur you know, very high costs because you're making so many of these parts. So as an example, in the CPU world, if we have a material that makes up our stack up and we know that we want to improve the next generation of IO, we might look at those materials and, and say, well, okay, we, we know we can get additional performance if we lower the loss tangent of our buildup materials. And so we might investigate a new material that has a lower loss tangent. And everybody gets excited and says, okay, this is a great choice. Let's go ahead and make this choice. But oftentimes we find that some of these new advanced materials, if you characterize them at different use conditions, perhaps at elevated temperature um, or at different humidity conditions, you can sometimes get these inversions where the performance isn't as you think it, as you measured at the lower temperatures or at the other conditions. And so when your operating condition of your device is different than the characterization point that you, you look at your materials at, you can get this inversion and you can ultimately end up with a worse performing product because your metrology didn't really characterize the material at your use condition. And so if you think about this in a high volume application, if you made this choice based on this lower temperature measurement, it might that choice of improving your material might be something like $2. That would be a very reasonable number for a CPU space. And if you were thinking about a high volume uh, manufacturing scenario where maybe your that particular product flow has a, a, a sale of 40 million units, pretty soon that decision that you've made turns into a lot of money very quickly. And so this is to kind of highlight the importance of being able to have accurate metrologies that operate across a lot of different use conditions. Similarly, if you're in a condition where you're mostly concerned about performance and you're not that cost sensitive, this type of uh, decision also impacts you, right? Because you could pick the wrong material and potentially not gain the performance that you're interested in. Additionally, in, in this space that we're talking about, almost all of the end users ultimately buy their dielectrics. They're not actually in the business of making the dielectrics. So for example, a CPU manufacturer will source their dielectric materials from, from companies that make the dielectrics, and then we bring them in-house to build our packages. So what that means from a practical standpoint is that the selection of those materials, not only do you have to actually pick the right material, but you and your supplier have to agree 
on the performance metric for that material. So typically for the dielectric materials, that would be loss tangent and dielectric constant. So you need a way that when you do a measurement and your supplier does a measurement, that you ultimately end up with the same answer. Because if you don't, it makes it very difficult to procure the right materials from your suppliers. And obviously, because of these things, the precision of your metrologies and of that ultimate value that you, you did settle on for your spec, the precision and the accuracy of that matter quite a bit to the overall performance of your product. So with this in mind, INEMI had a, has had a, a number of efforts in the last couple of years that I just want to highlight on and direct you to links for potential more information. So in 2021, we completed a project called the 5G Millimeter Wave Materials Assessment and Characterization Project. This was basically a, a very detailed survey of the state-of-the-art permittivity measurements spanning into the millimeter wave range looking at all of the potential challenges that they have and the limitations looking into the, the next generation of uh, measurement tools. The highlight of that, and again, this is a very in-depth project. It went on for quite a while. There's a link here for more information, but to kind of highlight the results from that, we had an experiment where we sent out dielectric samples to a bunch of really expert labs in dielectric measurements around the globe. And sending those same samples around to the different labs and examining the results of the measurements that we got from each lab using a variety of different equipment sets. And you can see from this data that there's something on the order of, you know, plus or minus 4% difference in the results that we got from, again, the expert level labs. And so what this kind of told us at this for, from this study is that the state of the art metrologies that we have today aren't really good enough moving forward. You know, you can, we've learned to live with this kind of variability, but moving forward to get more accurate designs and, and higher performance, you really have to have metrologies that are, are better than this. So following that effort, there was an effort that was completed last year uh, related to the millimeter wave electrical test technology roadmap. So this is a roadmap that was funded through NIST's Advanced Manufacturing uh, technology roadmap program. And there's a section in there that covers low loss dielectric materials characterization specifically. It, it includes a detailed projection of what the group saw as the gaps in the in the metrologies moving into the future and covering sort of a 10 year time window. The idea was to look at what we have today, what we think we need in the next 10 years, document those so that um, People look at working in this space, and you know, ideally, the the research institutions that are developing new metrologies have a guidance as to what what we the industry as a whole feels are the gaps that need to be addressed. There are a number of key contributors to this project, um, actually generating the document, but the whole team set that that reviewed this and came up with the roadmap really consisted of. A, a large number of people from industry, from different industries, and from the equipment vendors and the tool vendors. Uh, so it was you know, a very nice summary of what uh, industry as a whole thinks are the gaps moving into the future. And I would again direct you to the link at the bottom of this. It, it is a very nice document that describes in great detail the, the gaps that we have moving forward. So from both of these efforts, one of the key findings that came out of this is that industry lacks traceable reference standards for permittivity measurements. And those are really needed to drive these new metrologies forward and to improve the variability that we see when we do these measurements at different locations using different equipment sets. And so that led to the project that we're talking about today, which was launched in June of 2022. This is the INEMI 5G millimeter wave permittivity reference material development project. And many of the same players in the previous projects were involved in this. Um, with a few others. This is again a worldwide group of labs and researchers that are working on this project. There is a website that we have. This, the material that we're going to talk about today is really a high level summary of the work that's been done here. Uh, we have a number of intermediate updates on this project that go into greater detail and greater technical detail. So if you're interested in this material and you see something you want to know more about, you know, either ask us or you can go to, go to this website and, and look at some of the materials that, that cover the, the detailed technical aspects. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about what this project is. There are a few objectives that we have from this, and at a high level, the main idea here is that we want as a group of you know, industry and, and people that are using these metrologies to recommend to NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, 
a set of material recommendations and a set of requirements for SRM, uh, standard reference material artifact that would satisfy the needs of industry and what those requirements might be so that NIST can go down the path to develop a traceable standard. And we once we had those uh, um, requirements, we wanted to generate a set of prototypes that would be compatible with most of the common tool sets. And we would want to demonstrate that the prototypes that we have are robust enough for the labs to use. And in general, verify the idea that, that we would be able to consume these um, SRMs out in industry. And so the strategy that we came up with for this was to essentially identify some candidate materials, and then we would make um, prototypes and verify that the materials meet the requirements by sending them around to these uh, international labs in two different round robin experiments. And we'll talk about the details of those in a minute. As we're doing this, NIST is obviously part of this project, and so we would provide uh, input into NIST as they're working on the pathway to traceability and ultimately hand off all of these recommendations and findings to NIST so that they can finally develop the SRM. And that's kind of where we are today. So if you think about this project, there's kind of two parallel activities going on. One is sort of from the INEMI side of things that looks at the industry usability and the robustness and sort of this proof of concept thing. We also wanted to look into industry and provide some idea about what the demand for consumption of these standards would be so that NIST has some ad additional um, drive to understand that you know at what level industry will be consuming these and so what kind of a you know manufacturing process do they need to have into the future and have industry buy-in so that we have a good you know robust um, demand for these things that that NIST can use to to resource the internal requirements for actually getting this done and in parallel to that we have a bunch of NIST tasks that are involving finding ways to come up with the traceable dimensions for the different art uh, cavities that are used for the measurements, finding how to find traceable measurements for the actual samples, looking at the accuracy of S parameters, and, you know, all of the detailed technical work that's required to ultimately come up with a standard that would be accepted by the international community. And we'll we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about this later. We'll have New Lucas come in and, and go through some of the uh, updates on, uh, on this front. So as we're doing this, the thing that's nice about this type of a project is we get feedback from NIST about what would be, what would make their life easier in terms of um, having a pathway to traceability. And then they get feedback from the INEMI group as to what would be more useful for industry. And so as this goes on, there's this back and forth that makes this a very successful uh, project flow. Okay, we started out with a timeline looking at about eight quarters. We expected this would take about two years to uh, develop, and we had some rough, uh, a rough timeline. We went ahead and worked our way through this. Along the way, there were several key milestones in terms of findings that we had related to the, the samples and related to the way you do some of the processing. These are documented in, in more detail in the intermediate reports. So again, I direct you to the website and those intermediate reports for more information on that. There's also a, a piece of time at which NIST picks up and starts doing a lot of the very detailed um, technical work internal to NIST to develop a standard. And then ultimately we were able to bring in uh, the closure of this particular project from an INEMI standpoint by about a quarter because we were able to wrap up the INEMI portion of these activities early. The work at NIST will continue uh, to wrap up some of the details there, and ultimately they will then um, reach the certification for these particular uh, SRMs. So we, we were able to do this a little bit earlier than expected, so that's nice. Everything progressed quite well. All right, with that background, I want to talk a little bit about the agenda. So I want to talk about what a standard is, because I think there's some confusion for people that haven't been um, talking about this for the last two years. We'll talk about what we think the requirements are for an SRM for permittivity, and th these are basically the outcomes of the studies that th this group has done. And we'll, so we'll describe what we found, and then we'll wrap up with this section talking about the summary of inputs to NIST. And this is sort of what we see as the official handoff to NIST, um, summarizing the requirements that industry sees for one of these SRMs.
And then I'll hand it off to Lucas, and he will come in and talk about the progress on the NIST side for developing the path to traceability, talk about some of the activities that go on in terms of the dimensioning. There's some very interesting and detailed technical things that have to happen that people don't recognize goes on within NIST. Um, so I think that is is kind of a very interesting story. Um, and then he'll go through that and we'll kind of wrap it up with what what's next. Okay. So what is a standard? I've talked about this a number of times in some of the subgroup meetings, uh, but just to level set everybody, I like to use the example of a length standard. And so if you are in the mechanical space, it's a little bit easier, I think, to conceptualize this. You can purchase these gauge blocks, and these are reference length materials. And so if you buy these, they come with a certificate of inspection that describes not only the actual measured length and the tolerance associated with the particular sample that you are, are purchased that you've purchased it also provides information about the traceability of that dimension back to the um through a, a series of steps back to the definition of the meter and so the idea here is that when you purchase one of these things you get a physical artifact that has a known value of thickness with a very known and well-specified tolerance or uncertainty on that thickness. And the thing that's interesting about this value that you get is it's, it's the, Ermi, can you mute something? Okay, um, the, the thing that's interesting about this value is that it is really the true value of the thickness of this device. It's a value that's accepted internationally by the international community, and it isn't a value that somebody measured in their own lab and has um, you know, uncertainties around that particular measurement. It is the value that is accepted, uh, at least within the uncertainty limit. And so if you take this device and you use it in any sort of uh, dimensioning tool that will give you some value, you know that what you should get from that tool is the specified value. And in that sense, the measurement device, the difference that you get from a measurement device versus what the value is on this certificate gives you some idea about the error or uncertainty associated with that actual measurement device. And so this is nice because it means you know you have a reference with which you can do a measurement on and you can prove the quality of your measurement equipment. And so you know, in the mechanical space, I think this is a little bit easier to comprehend, but it, for permittivity, we essentially want to have the same type of a setup. So for permittivity, we would have some sort of a, a, a material that's an SRM. It would come with a serial number and a specified value for dielectric constant with a tolerance and loss tangent, again, with an uncertainty at a specific frequency or a set of frequencies. And like the length standard, this particular material would be traceable again back to the definition the fundamental definitions of the si units and in this case the farad and the meter and so like the gauge block case you would purchase this artifact it would have a very definite value and a definite uncertainty and that value again would be something that's accepted by the international community and so if you sent this to another lab they measured it and got a different answer that's an indication of an error within those labs as opposed to some unknown with the material. And so then you can apply this standard to all or any uh, given permittivity measurement tool or you know, including the software and everything else. When you get values out of these things, you know how much, uh, you know, what your uncertainty of that tool is because you know what the actual value of the material is you're measuring. And so this gives you, uh, again, a nice way to not only determine the accuracy of the tool sets that you're using, but it provides the manufacturers with ways to poten potentially improve the accuracies of their tools. And it gives people that are developing new tools a uh, stake in the ground where they can um, certify that some new methodology that they have is actually functional and yields a, a good result. So. With respect to this, the goal of this particular project is to help NIST develop this standard so that it's usable by industry. Because you could imagine the case where you develop one of these things and NIST has a very good understanding of what the true value of the thing is, but because of constraints with the, with the sample size or, or what have you, it isn't something that's practically usable by industry. 
And so that's the goal here is to make sure that as this thing becomes developed, that it's, it's useful and practical for industry. Now, as we go through this, I will probably interchangeably uh, call it a standard or an SRM. The SRM is short for standard reference material, and this is uh, the terminology that you'll see if you go to the NIST website to purchase these types of items. Okay, so what are the requirements that we see uh, as an industry for a usable permittivity standard? So one of the obvious ones is that the standard material, the standard sample that's produced must work with all of the common tool sets. So from our past experience and looking at those projects that I mentioned earlier, we have a lot of knowledge about the existing tool sets that are common within industry. We also know that the sample that's created must be stable over time. So if NIST certifies it today and they ship it to you, it, it must be some material that is stable in its permittivity and loss tangent into the future. So it, it, we have to have a material that you know won't change over time. The material needs to be reasonably free from environmental variations and specifically humidity. Um, you can't have a, a standard reference that requires you to have a very specific humidity in your lab condition because that makes it impractical for a, a user. We also believe that the standard has to be physically capable of doing many measurements without damage to this, the sample itself. And this is important because if you purchased one of these samples and you could only do two or three measurements with it before you damaged it, then it really wouldn't be useful to you as a standard. And so we, we have some level of robustness that we think these materials must provide. Another aspect is that we think they need to be reasonably easy to source over time so that you can have a sustainable method for manufacturing. And the idea here is that if NIST makes a bunch of these this year and then they all get consumed, we don't want it to be so difficult to recreate and procure new samples in the future that NIST would then not uh, undertake that effort. And then one that, that is specific, I think, to the permittivity problem has to do with the thickness variation of the material sample. If you take a cross section of the permittivity sample, um, there will be some thickness variation. And so if you look at this cross section here, you know, if you measure the thickness as a function of horizontal dimension, it varies. And it turns out for permittivity, for permittivity reference, you really can't tolerate very much thickness variation. We need something that looks more like a perfect flat uniform thickness sample uh, for the permittivity SRM to actually be useful. And so we'll talk about that. Why is this so important uh, in this particular case? It turns out that for all of the commonly used permittivity measurements today, that the thickness value of the sample is a key input into the extraction of the dielectric constant. And in almost all cases, it works out that the uh, permittivity error that you get when you do the extraction has essentially a one-to-one -one relationship with the thickness error. And so what that means is if you have, let's say, a 100 micron thick sheet sample that has, let's say, one micron of thickness variation in it or thickness uncertainty, you essentially end up immediately with a 1% error or uncertainty in the extracted dielectric constant. And so if you're thinking about an SRM where you want to have a precise value and you want that value to be known to better than 1%, you're going to have to have an extremely flat sample uh, and with uniform thickness. And there's a couple of challenges that come along with this, not only in terms of having the sample be uniformly thick, but in terms of the measurement of the sample thickness. So you can imagine two different samples, one that perhaps has a concave shape and one that has a convex shape that might actually have the same average thickness if you were to average over the entire surface of the sample. But in most of these methods, the electrical cavity region where the electric fields are actually interacting with the sample material, uh, they're usually limited. And so in these two cases, you could potentially have a situation where you have a sam two samples that have the same average thickness, but electrically in the different tool sets, they could have a different effective thickness. And so you end up with these cases that if the sample isn't very uniform and average thickness doesn't do you very much good. There's also the case where if you have a sample that perhaps has some surface topology and you take a measurement of this with say a micrometer where you're going to measure the peak to peak uh, thickness of the sample, you can end up with samples that maybe have a different type of surface features 
that would give you the same micrometer reading and yet would again have a completely different electrical um, effective thickness in the tool sets. And so this becomes a really important thing. Um, and one of the things you might imagine if you look at this is you say, well, all right, if these surface features are kind of limited in size, maybe the, the easiest thing to do would be to make a very thick sample. And it turns out that that's true. If you make a very thick sample, the relative error in your, your surface topology or your thickness variation is a smaller percentage, and that leads to a lower effective error. And so this would tend to drive you to want to use very thick samples for an SRM. However, we're predominantly interested in the high frequency case in the millimeter wave region. And it turns out that almost all of the measurement tools have some limitation in terms of the thickness of the sample. And that is the higher frequency you want to go, you tend to have to have thinner samples. And so this is kind of a competing requirement. That is to get to millimeter wave, you're going to have to have thinner samples. So, so there is an upper limit that you can have. And in fact, there is sort of an optimal thickness that solves both of these problems. So when you look at this problem in whole and you realize you have these two competing challenges, uh, what that leads you to conclude is that for the SRM, the thickness of the SRM has to be extremely uniform and it has to be flat essentially to sub-micron precision in order to achieve better than a 1% uncertainty in the SRM value. And so, you know, you can think about more complicated measurements for thickness and all this sort of stuff, but they just really don't solve this problem. And you ultimately really have to have a good, uh, saw, uh, you know, flat and uniform um, material set for an SRM. So let's move on and talk a little bit about the materials that we looked at. Um, early on, there was a lot of interest in the COP material set. These are cyclo-olefin polymers. They're widely used uh, by individual labs as material references because they have very nice electrical characteristics. They're very uh, frequency independent and they have very low loss. And in general, they're really nice electrical materials. So we initially spent some time looking at these materials because we thought that potentially that they would be a good possibility for an SRM. If you look at what they are physically, they look generically like a piece of plastic sheet. They're flexible, clear generally. But ultimately we found that these materials, at least in the way that we could procure them, had more thickness variation than was tolerable for the SRM project. And when I say that, again, I, you have to think that the thickness variations that we're talking about are like one micron. So even though these sheets are for all practical purposes and industry use cases, they are really uniform and very uh, highly smooth. You know, one micron is enough to mess us up. So um, the typical thickness variation for these materials just was not, not good enough and we had no way to really make them any better. We also found that these materials were likely to be degraded by finger oil. So they're sensitive to um, material changes due with oil, and that was a concern for the longevity and um, you know, stability of, of an SRM if we were to use these materials. They're also relatively soft and easily scratched. So if you see this picture on the right, this is the result of uh, you know, a few days of different measurements and routine handling with, with a reasonable amount of care you end up with surface scratches on the sample. And so for the purposes of an SRM, you know, again, this leads you into having uh, a changing sample as time goes on, and now you have additional uncertainties associated with these surface damage. And so the end of this is that the stability of this type of material for long-term can't be guaranteed to the level that would be required for a standard reference material. And so even though these are really great materials, they just really don't quite meet the requirements for the SRM. So another material we looked at, which ultimately is the one that we're going to recommend, is high purity fused silica, uh, specifically Corning's HPFS 7980. You can see from this picture, this is basically glass. Uh, you know, a casual observer would look at this and think it's a sheet of glass in wafer form. These are fairly robust mechanically in terms of like scratching and those sorts of things. So we expect that there will be low wear with time. They're very low loss and isotropic, and also fortunately are stable with humidity. And so these meet those requirements of the SRM. 
Another feature that these materials have that we think open up the use conditions for an SRM is that these materials can be metallized by consumers. So if you have a research project going on where you're making some microwave circuit and you would like to have a precision substrate that you know with great confidence what the dielectric uh, constant is for that substrate, you will be able to purchase these SRMs and metallize them on your own so that you have essentially a known substrate. And we think this opens up a lot of potential avenues in research because the, the uncertainty in the materials of the, uh, these projects is usually a you know one of the longer poles in the tent, so to speak, for the uncertainties in um, some of the measurements. So if you have the opportunity to eliminate many of those uncertainties by just getting a known substrate that you have a certified value for, we think there's a lot of potential opportunity there. The material is also cleanable with common cleaning mat uh, materials like IPA and acetone without damage. And so this is nice because if you do get a fingerprint on it, it's relatively easy to clean. There were some potential issues with this. One was that the samples that are available from Corning are too thick. So there was no opportunity to procure these samples directly in a way that they were uh, of a dimension that, that was going to be usable across many of the tool sets. And so for this to be practical, we needed to find a way to make them thin while retaining that ultra low TTV. And so basically, if we didn't find a method for doing this, this material was not going to work either. Fortunately, uh, Mosaic Microsystems is also a participant in this effort, and they are experts in the thin glass processing space. And so they were able to come up with a process by where they would take the incoming thick wafers from Corning bring them in-house to Mosaic, and then they have a proprietary wafer thinning process that allows them to thin these wafers down to the dimensions that we need while maintaining this ultra-low total thickness variation. And so this is really a key enabler for this material for it to be able to be used as an SRM. They also have processing capability that would allow them to uh, laser cut the, the final wafers and provide these as coupons into the uh, system for us to use as, as the SRM blanks. So uh, ultimately they were able to get this process dialed in and the coupons that they are now able to provide us have something on the order of about 300 nanometers of total thickness variation. And so this meets the dimensional precision required for our SRM. So this was a very nice uh, milestone in the project. So as I mentioned before, you know, we wanted to have a test process to make sure that we weren't um, fooling ourselves that these were gonna be handable and usable in industry. So we have uh, a, a way, you know, we wanted to go through and test this. So each of the available tool sets that are common in industry have different sample dimensional needs. They have a good over, uh, overlap for the thickness needs, but in terms of X, Y, there's quite a bit of variability. So some of these tools, have a minimum, uh, they all have a minimum constraint on the sample size. So the sample size has to be at least a certain size. And in some cases, the tools also have a limitation on the maximum sample size. And if the sample is too big, it just won't physically fit in the tool. Some of the tools require circular type samples or at least samples that have rounded corners. And some have uh, require um, more than one sample. And so in looking at all of these material requirements and overlapping them, we did sort of a study on this to try and understand what is the best form factor to recommend to uh, enable the, as many of these tools as possible to use the same type of sample or at least the same physical sample. And so we spent some time looking at this tool geometry and trying to understand it. We then had the samples prepared at Mosaic. And then we went into our first round robin experiments where we shipped these samples around to the international labs for testing. We ultimately gathered feedback from those from that experiment and then in, took that feedback and created a new set of samples for the second round robin experiment and we repeated the testing. Ultimately, we gathered final recommendations and feedback from that second round robin experiment to conclude, uh, you know, how, uh, make assessments on the usability of these. And ultimately through this process, we ended up with two different sample geometries that we believe will span all of the common tool sets reasonably well. So as I mentioned, there's you know in the sub reports, there's a lot of details for each of these individual round robins. I just want to provide a high level uh, 
summary for these. So in the first round robin, the sample thickness that we started out with was at 135 microns. These were sent to nine labs around the globe and four different measurement methods were used. The split post dielectric resonator, split cavity resonator, fabry perot and the balanced circular disc resonator methods were used on these samples. Ultimately, this round robin, we ended up collecting thousands of data points at these different labs and did a lot of data analysis looking at the results. I just want to highlight kind of the high level uh, result of the data. This is all the data overlapped, showing the different labs using the different methods at the at, uh, spanning this frequency range. Now, I'll talk a little bit more about this, the spread in the data here in a minute, but the, the key point of this round robin was to understand the handleability of these different samples. And ultimately what we found is that although we were able to capture a lot of data and we did a lot of measurements on these samples, the labs, ultimately 70% of the labs experienced some level of breakage with the samples. So we, we thought that that was probably too high and that we needed to make some improvement on that. Uh, one thing I'll note is if you look at the spread here, this there are biases in these tools and this really goes back to the need for an SRM. So we don't know which of these values are actually correct or more correct than the others because we don't have an SRM with which to know the true value, what the true value should be, okay? So with that, we went back and we had some, some hypothesis about why these were cracking. And we suspected that the laser cutting process perhaps was a little bit uh, harsh. So in the cutting process at the edge where the laser makes the cut, you end up with kind of some rough edges. And we thought that at these edges, there might be some crack initiation sites that made for weak weaknesses in the materials, such that if you were handling them, these were you know, basically caused a weak region that would induce a crack and, and ultimately failure of the sample. So Mosaic went off and they developed a healing etch to their process so that after doing the laser cut, they would go back into some sort of a, a processing step that would heal the edges and smooth them out while retaining, again, retaining the, the TTV performance of the material samples. And so with this, we um, also decided that we would increase the sample thickness a little bit to about 150 microns. This is sort of the maximum thickness that's uh, uh, reasonable to span the tool sets that are, are common in industry. And so we had a new set of standards made or, or prototype standards. Uh, Mosaic created these and ultimately these ended up with something on the order of about 0.3% TTV. So again, for these samples, we're talking about thickness variations that are on the order of only a couple hundred nanometers. And so this is a, you know, a really nice, perfect material, basically. Uh, we also had the advantage that it, by this stage of the project, NIST had acquired their optical thickness measurement tool that they are procuring for this project so that they would be able to measure accurately the thickness of every individual SRM when they ultimately produce them. And so with that, we sent the samples around to the different labs. And as you'd imagine, the data, the numerical data coming back looks very similar to the original proof of concept, but this time we experienced quite a bit less breakage. Um, clearly, again, you know, we don't know what the right answer is because we don't have a standard, but uh, the goal of this round robin was again to improve the handling capability. So thousands of data points collected, lots of handling, and ultimately we went from a situation where in the first round robin we had 70% of of the labs experiencing some breakage of the samples to a state in the second one where we only had 30% of the labs experiencing some breakage. And so this was a significant improvement. Now, you might look at this and think, well, 30%, that's still quite a bit of breakage, but the handling that goes on during one of these round robins is pretty significant. Uh, it's not just simply a single measurement. The labs are asked to put the sample in their measurement tool, take it out, flip it over, measure it again, take it out, flip it upside down, measure and rotate it again and repeat that process uh, four times and to do that for every tool that they're going to do the measurement on. And so even though there's some breakage here, it really represents a lot more handling than we think the typical use case represents um, for the SRM in, in real life. So ultimately we concluded from this that the fused silica samples are robust enough for the SRM needs. Now I want to talk briefly about a noteworthy finding with respect to the measurement data. 
um, you know, as you looked at those plots, there's there is some quite a bit of spread there. And all of the tools had distinct biases from the average value of all the measurements. And again, this is exactly why we need a standard. We would expect that if every tool was accurate, they would all give the same result. But clearly that isn't what happens. And without a standard, it's very hard to develop a tool that would do that. But the thing that stood out in the data was that the BCDR method, the tools that used that method, for whatever reason, seem to have a significantly larger offset. And so if you look at this plot in the right, the gray, dots are all of the non-BCDR measurements and the ones that are um, red, uh, yellow, and purple are from the BCDR measurements. And they tend to be lower. So if you look at sort of the average of all of this data, you can see that there's you know, clearly a bias to a lower value from the BCDR data. So this is interesting. And with some small amount of effort in terms of um, looking at effects that could be impacting the results, we found that variability with the clamping force on some of the tools seemed to have some influence over the result. There was also some modeling work that went went on that kind of indicated that very small air gaps in the tool set between perhaps due to like scratches on the metal plates could play a role. And in any case, there was a number of things that could be further investigated with these tool sets. And we think that that, you know, is really, again, another use case for why this SRM is valuable because once you have a material that you can measure that you know what the right answer is, you can use that to help figure out what these biases are in the different tool sets and then how to improve them. So ultimately, this led us with the final recommendations on dimensions for the uh, SRM sizes. Uh, the thickness we think is 150 microns is appropriate. This is really kind of the maximum upper range for broad tool compatibility. and maintaining uh, as low as possible dimensional uncertainties because the dimensional uncertainties increase with the de decreasing thickness. Uh, one sample size in terms of XY that we were recommending is 90 by 90. This is nice because it's used for, it allows some of the lower frequency tools to um, work. And it's also um, useful at, potentially, again, as, as a bare substrate for those research uh, substrate applications that I mentioned earlier, because you have physical size here, you can put larger circuits on it. And then the other size is 35 by 45 millimeters. This is uh, good for some of the uh, SCR tools specifically. It's a little bit easier to handle. And although the corner radii on these things look like it's decorative and only there to prevent the corners from breaking, it turns out that they're is actually a, a template for this and it's relatively important because this particular radius allows the larger samples to be used in some of the smaller tools. So there was a lot of effort that went into trying to understand you know, how could you maximize the usage, uh, the inner usage capability of these, these different sample sizes. So finally, we come to the summary of input for NIST. We have a material, the HPFS 7980. We think that meets the industry's requirements for an SRM. We have a recommended thickness. We believe that this provides for robust handling. We've identified a process through Mosaic that can meet the very stringent TTV requirements that will lead to a condition where we have essentially less than about 0.2% uncertainty due to that TTV. So that's, that's really a, a phenomenal result. These will be compatible with most common tool sets spanning the 10 to 110 gigahertz range. And then we have some dimensional re uh, recommendations. From the user standpoint, the material, the SRM, um, will ultimately end up having a dialect constant somewhere in the neighborhood of 3.8 with a loss tangent that's less than 0 0.001. So this reserve represents a very good low loss material, again, with low, no low moisture absorption and uh, high isotropy. We also did have uh, a reasonably good assessment of the demand requirements. I didn't talk too much about that here, but Keysight plans to ship these SRMs with their dielectric measurement tool sets when the SRMs are available. And so that puts us, uh, us in a place where NIST has um, you know, a, a reasonable amount of consumption of these SRMs and so that they can plan into the future as to how to make these things. And then we also have a number of other participants and vendors that are planning on purchasing these as well. So that's kind of the summary for input to NIST. Now, before I move on and pass this over to Lucas to talk about the NIST portion of the project, I just wanna add a few additional comments related to the practicality of, of this arrangement where INEMI serves as a collaborative, collaborative forum 
for these types of developments, specifically for the development of other standards and uh, standard method development activities. This turned out to be a very positive uh, method for doing this development. Um, and it really, this, this project really showcases the effective process for industry co collaboration and ultimately being able to take those inputs from industry and transferring them to a standards institute like NIST in order to get some action done. Uh, so we think this is really a great way to link industry into the process like this. There's also a couple of interesting side benefits for the individual users. So from an industry standpoint, it would be very difficult, say, for example, me coming from Intel to go directly to NIST and say, hey, I, you know, I want you to develop a standard for me because NIST is going to say, well, that's one industry I've got. You know, I, I need to work on projects that affect everybody. And so having a bunch of industry partners going through a consortium like this it really gives you critical mass for developing uh, and making the request for this type of a development action. And we also found a number of cases where having a lot of industry partners and academics and NIST involved together in these meetings led to a really good set of technical input because you know, the individual expertise, although it's very high in, from all of the players, when you get together and you have a forum where you can discuss these I, the technical merits of these ideas and you find different expertise, um, it really helps the development. You really end up with a situation where you have a lot of better ideas and you can overcome some of the challenges that you probably couldn't do on your own. There's also a benefit here in the sense that some of the corporate pressures in terms of competitiveness, that it would be very difficult for me to work with, say, uh, AMD together to go to NIST are alleviated by having this consortium group that goes through INEMI where you're really working with a broad industry. So it makes it easier to to come together, even though there are uh, what would typically be some sort of competitive barriers. And so, you know, this is nice because it, it really gives NIST also a way to say that they're supporting the entire industry as opposed to some particular subset of the industry. And then the other comment that I wanted to make is sort of about the individual user here. So uh, the individual players in, in the consortium. Um, oftentimes these projects are pretty lengthy, like this is a two year project. And uh, sometimes the, that's, a, that's a long time for an internal industry project to stay alive. So if I'm working on this project within Intel, after a year and a half, you know, it sometimes can be difficult to retain managerial support for a long term project. And, but when you have a consortium like this and you, you know, your management starts asking questions, you say, well, we've got a broad industry consensus and an INEMI group that's doing this. It makes a lot more sense to the management chain as to why we're doing it. And it gives weight to your technical feedback that, hey, this is a requirement. Because if it's just you asking your management and telling them that they, you, they need this thing to be developed, they might not really understand the gravity of it, but when you have the industry consortium and you can say, you know, all of our competitors are also asking for the same thing from NIST, you get a lot more support internally. And so overall, I just really want to emphasize that this turned out to be a very good way to accomplish this type of a project. And if you're thinking about a standard that you need for something else, this is a good potential method to, to get that done. OK, and so I want to hand this off to Lucas now, who is from NIST, and he'll talk about some of the activities associated with the cavity dimensioning and the technical end of um, the stuff that's going on at NIST. So Lucas. Sure thing. Did that work? We're, we're all good on yes. the team side of things? Yes. Awesome. OK. So hi, my name is Lucas Enright. Thanks, Mike, for the introduction. Uh, as he said, I'm a grad student over at NIST Boulder, here to talk a little bit about some of the finishing touches for this project at NIST and kind of making sure that there's a successful project handoff between all the hard work that's been done with the INEMI group to successfully completing this standard at NIST. So a lot of the NIST tasks that have involved things like dimensioning all of our cavities and our samples and propagating our uncertainties along the way um, has been going on sort of the whole while that this INEMI effort has been rolling for the past two years and really four years or something if you include the previous project. Um, but we're really kind of wrapping up, especially moving into the uncertainty propagation and a lot of the documentation steps that we need to make a successful standard at NEST. Um, so these final steps really are kind of underway and hopefully we can talk about some of the last ones going on and where the hangups are. Um, so 
SRM development, you can imagine, is quite complicated. So every input for all of our material property measurements need to be traceable back to the fundamental SI base units with known uncertainties. And the known uncertainties and uh, the fact that this is all traceable is really both where the magic happens, but it's also where the difficulties lie. So we need to be able to measure our sample and our cavity dimensions. Um, and as Mike mentioned before, something like one micron uncertainty on these samples is huge. So we need to be much more precise than that and have much smaller uncertainties, and we need those uncertainties to be ca uh, characterized traceably. Um, additionally, we need to measure our S parameters and make these actual microwave measurements so that we can extract our resonance frequency and quality factor for these resonators. And we need to have traceable uncertainties on those as well. And thankfully, we developed this uh, we really built up kind of existing capabilities in these analytic cavity models so that we can propagate these uncertainties from all of these input measurements. Um, and we can have all these traceable measurements, excuse me, traceable uncertainties propagated through this analytic model so that we can extract material properties with traceable uncertainties so that we can have our final material properties traceable back to the SI base units. Um, so we have to kind of combine all these steps and we have to combine them all through this analytic cavity model. And uh, it's been quite the journey along the way. So uh, the first really kind of cool part of the dimensioning took place at the NIST Dimensional Metrology Group in Gaithersburg, Maryland. And Mike very kindly linked this video and I got excited because I realized that our actual devices show up in this YouTube video that has a few hundred thousand views. So we can all now proudly say that we know someone who's YouTube famous and his name is John Staup. Um, but John very kindly took his coordinate measurement machine, which is sort of one of the definite, one of the defining uh, traceable measurement methods for distances and for uh, part dimensions um, it, at NIST Gaithersburg. And he dimensioned the inside of our cavities using these fine probe tips on his coordinate measurement machine. And he was able to give us measurements of the inner radius and length of our cylindrical resonators with uncertainties on the order of microns or submicrons in some cases. So for instance, this 28 gigahertz resonator has a radius of about seven and a half millimeters, and we know that to within plus or minus 200 nanometers, which is crazy to me. Um, and it's really important, believe it or not, that we have such small dimensional uncertainties because it helps us kind of minimize our final uncertainties in our material properties. Um, but really, I, I believe these slides we uploaded at the end. I highly recommend everyone check out this video. It's like 15 minutes long and it's really cool. Um, and they really are our resonators. Um, as far as dimensioning the samples, we use chromatic white light sensors. And so these basically we have a sensor on each side above and below the, surf, the sample. And we can use the focusing of different wavelengths of light to determine the displacement from each sensor to its respective sample surface. So if you can find the top surface and the bottom surface and you know how far apart your sensors are, you know exactly how thick that sample is. Um, and then we can use this stage that translates so that we can measure these samples at regular intervals. And so this blue sensor head is just the top of these two sensors that I was just talking about. Um, and we can make these measurements at 500 micron spacings so we can produce these really pretty uh, sort of heat maps of the thickness across our sample uh, X and Y dimensions. And we can do whatever statistics we want to determine the thicknesses. And I really want to highlight here something Mike said before um, was that Mosaic Microsystems has produced these beautiful samples for us with really, really low TTV, uh, total thickness variation. And it's been really impressive to see that really these are controlled to within a few hundred nanometers. Uh, and that's just really exciting and very impressive and very useful for making these standards. And this measurement technique is something that we can make traceable also through the help of our friend John at the Dimensional Metrology Group in Gaithersburg. So he can give us a reference sample that we can use to make our, um, our own tool traceable so we can make our own sample thickness measurements traceable. Microwave measurements, we use a vector network analyzer to measure the resonance frequency and the quality factor. You can imagine it's a bit more complicated than that, but not too much more complicated. Um, we take one of these resonators and we connect it to our vector network analyzer, and we measure the resonance frequency and the quality factor from the S parameters that we fit to just some known functional form. 
Um, and we can propagate our uncertainties from the measurement as well as from the fitting. And so we can use traceable S parameter calibrations courtesy of the S parameter calibration services at NIST Boulder, um, which conveniently is located within our group. Um, and we can combine their traceable calibrations with our own fitting so that we can propagate all the uncertainties coming from the S parameter calibration, from the fitting, and um, from the measurements. And so we can pool all these uncertainties that I'm talking about from the dimensions and from the resonance frequency and the quality factor through our own analytic cavity theory. So this is just kind of straightforward mode matching theory. We define every region of the resonator and the sample as these known cylinders of known dimensions. Um, and then we measure those dimensions. And when we stack all these cylindrical regions together, we end up just assuming that every surface is a perfect conductor and we assume that every uh, interface, the fields are continuous over those interfaces. And by enforcing all those conditions, we can create a system of equations with just a few unknowns, uh, namely our cavity and our sample dimensions and our microwave resonance frequencies. And so by combining all those things and kind of perturbing them within their dimensions, we can get a known permittivity with traceable uncertainties. So really just kind of combining what the whole process looks like from top to bottom. We have our collaborators at Mosaic Microsystems obtain some few silica wafers. They're able to use their own uh, kind of proprietary flattening process to thin these samples with super low thickness variations. And then they're able to laser cut these samples far better than we can, I learned the hard way. Uh, and use a hydrofluoric acid healing etch to clean up the edges to make these samples much more robust and handleable. And then they provide these coupons of whatever geometry you need. And we're able to use those coupons and measure them in our own optical dimensioning tool and in our own microwave resonators that we have dimensioned previously at NIST Gaithersburg. And we can combine the dimensions and the microwave measurements with traceable uncertainties through our own analytic computation to produce a standard. And we've deemed it here SRM42 uh, by request of Nate, who I believe is on the call still. Um, and so we can deliver this standard of known dielectric properties with very well-defined traceable uncertainties. And we can deliver that to any industry and any other end users. And I highlighted the, or I, I made note to include the word any other end users there because this is something that's useful to us in the future as well. So we can use these standards to create future standards. Just kind of through this stair step process, we can use this SRM for the dielectric constant to create standards for on wafer S parameters and eventually for on wafer power and any other on wafer or otherwise microwave characterization you can think of for other materials for phase. Um, this SRM is kind of the foundation upon which we can build all of that. So to flesh out that first example a little bit better, um, if we create, we did create this four inch wafer with space for two of these resonator coupons um, and a whole bunch of these on wafer characterization kits kind of lining the outside. And we created these in the NIST clean room, but they're really just two layer deposition wafers. It's nothing super complicated. And by measuring the coupons in the center here, we can create chips with a substrate of known permittivity. And once we know the permittivity, we know and we know what the on wafer devices, the CPWs and whatever other devices we may create, what those look like um, dimensionally, we know the impedance of these S parameters before we even um, measure any of our other devices. So we can use this as a calibration artifact going forward. So with that, sorry, I realize I talk very fast, um, especially early in the morning, but um, <laughs> I just wanted to kind of quickly give a summary of kind of how we've progressed and especially how we've moved from the INEMI effort to the NIST effort and what this looks like going forward. So we've had a really successful INEMI to NIST project handoff. We've gotten a lot of useful insight from the industry side of things and from all the participants. So really thank you everyone who participated in the INEMI project. Um, we have dim dimensioned and developed all the theory required for all these standards. And we're really just working on wrapping up the uncertainty propagation, especially through the thickness measurements and the S parameter measurements. Um, and then we're still kind of working on the official publication that will need to go out with this standard, which is going to be this long 
uh, special publication 260 from NIST that I don't know will be somewhere between 50 and 100 pages long, I imagine, um, and will have a very rigorous uncertainty propagation for all of these standards. And the hope is that uh, really kind of the community community anticipation is that these SRMs will be available in 2024. Um, so with that, I just kind of want to point people to a lot of the other work. A huge amount of work has come out of this NME project, and I thank you guys for your attention and thank you to everyone who uh, helped along the way. And this has been a really great project so far. Thank you, Mike and Lucas. Um, this is Urmi back again, uh, just to uh, wrap up the project. Um, I want to thank uh, everybody who uh, uh, patiently uh, listened to this, uh, in my opinion, <laughs> a very uh, interesting uh, story, technically uh, challenging work that was um, taken up. Um, I want to invite uh, everybody uh, to participate in the Q&A. Um, I, I realized that a lot of details were um, already presented, but if you have any questions, please submit th them through uh, chat. And um, and also, and I will uh, moderate the the chat and and go ahead and um, you know try to get uh, Lucas and uh, Mike to answer them. Uh, but before we go there, uh, I just wanted to also uh, point out one more thing. Um, yesterday, I attended the Chips Act Metrology, the NIST Metrology Groups. Uh, uh, series of webinars. Um, actually, it was sorry, a webinar with a series of speakers on projects. And you know, one of the things uh, highlighted in that uh, webinar yesterday was an SRM for thermal uh, characterization for uh, accurate thermal measurements, which obviously is extremely important in uh, packaging uh, and as well as uh, obviously in uh, the overall semiconductor industry. The reason I'm uh, just stating that is because similar to thermal um, issues, um, as Mike uh, pointed out earlier, uh, really the issues with effective dielectric uh, properties of materials in the microwave world or the millimeter wave world is um, you know, I would say equally important, uh, even though it's considered a little bit of a niche because, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, mil uh, things like RF and millimeter wave is always considered as a, as a black art, right? A lot of people uh, have a lot of un uh, trouble in understanding, uh, including me. So, uh, but just wanted to highlight that uh, there's a, you know, a lot of new efforts going on with even with the, uh, the CHIPS Act um, metrology um, division that was created um, under the uh, leadership of Marla Dowell and um, Nest. So uh, that, with that, uh, I think, um, Let's see uh, if anybody has uh, any comments, uh, please, or questions, uh, please send it through chat. And I know, Grace, you had raised your hand. Uh, are you uh, unable to unmute yourself? Uh, can you hear me or me? Yeah. OK, great, great. Yeah, I just wanted to thank the whole team. Um, and, and it's been a very much, uh, I think, as Mike said, a very good example of industry and academia, at cal you know, having a forum to collaborate in to enable everyone to move faster. So I'd like to compliment the, the work that's been done by those who initially started the project, including, um, most importantly, including Ermi uh, Ray, who has led uh, the projects and the whole program from the beginning. But uh, I think we're now seeing the results of collaboration um, across industry and academia and enabling the industry to move much faster, more effectively and cost effectively, most importantly, um, to address some of the new applications and challenges in 5G and 6G. So kudos and uh, congratulations to you all for, for your great efforts. Thank you, Grace. That was Grace O'Malley from uh, INEMI, uh, just wrapping up the project. Um, I also want to uh, thank. It looks like there's uh, no no questions uh, from the from the audience. We have about 
uh, 40 people still on online or slightly more. Um, and so I just want to specifically um, thank the very, very active. Uh, we have a technical working group. I think I think Mike alluded to this being, you know, bunch of experts in different fields which uh, came together, who came together. Uh, it was a global team, uh, Europe, uh, um, USA, and uh, folks from uh, uh, Asia, uh, including Taiwan, and um, um, uh, and it was uh, it has been a really really uh, great journey because of the contribution of that technical working group. So I want to thank every member of the technical working group. Um, most of them are on the call today, um, and uh, really thank them uh, for uh, making this this journey uh, success to date. Thank you again. Um, Shekhar, you had any comments? Yes, thanks, Urmi. I just wanted to, uh, first of all, echo what Grace and Urmi said. So thank you, everybody, because to me, as I look at the last three years of INME projects, there have been really some really good work in many areas. But I consider this work to be kind of one of the foundational pieces. And I really look, first of all, I want to thank you because you're all volunteering your time uh, away from your day-to-day -day work to kind of work on these kinds of projects globally, uh, very impactful. So from an INME perspective, INME staff, INME, I, I'm even going to echo several of the board members, really, really appreciate this work. So thank you, thank you, thank you for doing this. And if you have any ideas on how we can promote this and how we can share the value of what has been done to the industry, please feel free to reach out to me. Uh, it, it's very important people hear about this work and we're going to do our best as INME staff. But if you have any thoughts and ideas, if you think that there, there can be something more beyond this, please feel free to reach out to us. And and all of this I, I, I could not have happened without all the effort that Rumi has put behind the scenes. I know there are days when she's been working days and nights to pull this together. So Rumi, thank you. This this community building, this community development with all the experts, including you as an expert, could not have happened without all the hard work and dedication. So thank you one and all. And I know yesterday I spoke with Habib and he was very appreciative of all this work. I don't, I don't think he joined the call today because he has to travel. But I think there are a lot of uh, uh, people who have recognized this and I would like to communicate this more outside. So your thoughts and, and ideas are always helpful. So thanks again from the bottom of my heart. And if I can do anything to help, please feel free to reach out to me. Thanks for me. Okay, thank you, um, uh, Shekhar and Grace. Uh, we have a question from Christopher, Christopher Grabowski. Um, um, he is, um, so he's thanking us for gr uh, great work, but uh, he, his question is um, about uh, of, about whether we had uh, excluded a candidate material if it was, if it exhibited significant and anisotropic behavior, and if so, what would be your limit? Um, Mike, uh, I know we had talked a lot uh, about an anisotropic material. Uh, would you like to uh, answer or anybody else? Sure. I mean, at Lucas, yeah. Sure, yeah. So yeah, we actually spent quite a bit of time on the this question of isotropy. And we definitely wanted, I mean, because one of the other materials that obviously kind of bubbles up to mind is uh, sapphire. But we really didn't want to start out developing something that had a significant uh, anisotropic behavior because we wanted to be able to use the standard in both methods that are uh, provide permittivity out of plane and in plane uh, so that you could have you know one standard that satisfied both so we kind of ruled out pretty quickly sapphire even though there's a lot of properties there that would make it very nice um, and we looked at the uh, look, we, we did look at the fused silica materials to try and see if there were any anisotropic behavior that were significant. And there's a whole discussion on, on uh, you know, those studies, but basically we concluded that it's, it's highly isotropic. So we didn't have a specific limit that we had in mind going into this because I think, uh, you know, there, there the problem was constrained enough that there wasn't a, a whole lot of, um, you know, we didn't have a huge menu of materials that met all the other requirements, but we definitely did not want something that was clearly uh, anisotropic like sapphire. 
Thanks, Mike. Um, another question is from uh, Richard Lindman. Um, do you control the, the uh, gas composition inside the cavity of the resonators? Composition. I think that's one I can, probably for Lucas. Yeah, yeah I can answer that. Um, so sadly, no, that's one of the things that I would really love to get working and um, have a setup for in the near future. But being able to control even just within kind of the reasonable bounds of air, controlling humidity and um, temperature would be kind of a really impressive level of control and an extra couple of knobs we could tune. But also being able to test in different, different atmospheres and being able to check the resonance frequency of our empty cavity in different atmospheres are all things that would be really interesting, but sadly we don't have that capability right now. But your error, your uncertainty calculation includes that effect, right? Yes, exactly. So we instead we measure the temperature and humidity in our lab, and from there we can compute the permittivity of the air. Good point. It's, furthermore, it's like unlikely. It, sorry, this is Nate. It's unlikely that um, that for many applications you like users would measure the materials in a controlled um, gas environment. Um, so that might be difficult for people to do. And so um, the typical requirements for an SRM are to characterize them uh, at, uh, well, preferably at sea level, but at standard temperature and pressures in a typical characterization environment. So um, adding additional specifications that are sort of outside the use case might make it um, more difficult and place more requirements on the SRM than are actually required. Does that does that help? It, cer it certainly would be interesting to do, but right. No, I think it's um, a good answer. It, it might not help the SRM, and I would also imagine that uh, for most cases, like nitrogen, if you purged it with nitrogen, it would have very li little impact on the total permittivity. Yeah, that's a good answer. It would be really neat, but it wouldn't be strictly useful to the SRM. <laughs> I just yeah. think it would be cool. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, uh, Nate. That was Nate Orloff, uh, who is the co-chair uh, of the project. Um, the, the last comment, uh, he's uh, in the NIST uh, Boulder group, um, the, the RF group in Boulder also. Um, let's see, there is, uh, doesn't look like there's any other questions. Um, the folks uh, in from the TWIG, the uh, technical working group, if you have any comments about uh, any of this information, I think you can unmute yourself uh, like Nate did and speak up if you'd like. Otherwise, um, I'll give you in a couple of minutes. Uh, otherwise, I would uh, wrap it uh, wrap up the webinar today, uh, thanking everybody and the speakers. Um, also, one comment I I. I believe and uh, and I think that's 100% accurate that uh, in a couple of days or maybe just about a week because um, because it takes a little bit of time to compile all the information and send it, uh, but it will be available including the video recording um, to everybody who's registered for this. And you know, I know a lot of people in Asia probably uh, registered and it's not a Good time. Um, so, just for for everybody's information, for the project, we are holding another special session for the Asia team uh, that was part of the project later in this evening. So, again, um, thank you to Mike and uh, Lucas who uh, who will uh, go through the same set of information uh, for the Asia for the Asia project team, the INME Asia project team. Um, any comments from the Twig? OK, um, Charlie, you were going to say anything? Yeah, I just wanted to say, Mike, you were talking about how difficult this would be to do just as an individual company. I just want to emphasize that there is a broad application space for this type of effort with the standard reference material. And I, by the way, I'm Charlie Hill. I work at 3M and I do electrical characterization like many of the other folks on the twig. And I'm very excited for the work at NIST and to come up with that coupon that we can use to calibrate our instruments. Um, going back, Mike, to that plot you showed from the initial round robin and the variation across what you described to be expert labs was so alarming. And I'm grateful that we caught it and we understand it and that we're working towards rectifying those differences. I think it's really important as we move further and further into millimeter wave. So I just want to take this opportunity, Ermi, since you opened up the floor, to thank you so much for all the work you put into this program and to especially to Mike and Lucas for um, their leadership with the twig.
Thanks, guys. Very nice presentation, too. Great summary. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? OK, um, let's wrap up then. Uh, I'm going to stop recording. And thank you, everybody, um, again, one more time. And uh, and uh, wrap up this project. Uh, it has been a great journey. And uh, I am uh, um, thankful to everybody for uh, supporting me and everybody else for this journey. Bye bye. Have a good day. Good year, uh, everybody. Thank you. Great job. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.